He says, how do you get, how did you get into this line of work? Well, I spent uh, the early years of my life in the restaurant business, not because I loved restaurants, but because when you drop out of high school and you don't go to college, odds are you're probably going to end up working in a restaurant. And so I did. And although I didn't like the work, I always worked hard and I worked my way up the ladder rather quickly. Uh, so I ended up running all of the little Caesars here in, in Salt Lake City, all 42 of them. Actually, all across Utah, all 42 of them. And got stressed out of my mind doing that. Uh, my uncle enticed me to move to Las Vegas and to help him out or a friend of his out with his print, their printing firm. Anyway, um, long story short, the, the whole time that I was working for Little Caesars, and in fact, way before that, when I came home from my LDS mission, I had never had a political thought in my life. Never. And because my family, they weren't into politics. Uh, I found out later they were. They just never shared it with me. And I started working for my brother's roofing company when I came home from my mission. And I wanted to listen to music while on the roof. He wanted to listen to this new talk show. And I'm like, why do you want to listen to talk radio? What a joke. Let's listen to music. And he's like, no, no, no. You got to listen to this guy. You'll love him. So this guy, a man you might have heard of by the name of Rush Limbaugh. And so there we are on the roof and driving around from house to house, listening to this guy, Rush Limbaugh, every day. And say what you want about Rush, he makes you think. And he twists your gears. And I started to think. Started to consider. Started to ponder. Started to research started to research my own country, its founding, its presidents, its laws, its court cases, and started trying to call Rush, give him a piece of my mind. And so over the course of the next uh, well, probably uh, 10 years, whatever job I had, if I was on the road, I'd listen to Rush, and then I'd listen to Hannity. And I'd listen to the local talk show hosts. And when I was with KS, when I was with a Little Caesars, I used to call Doug Wright. And Amy Iverson was his producer at the time. And I'd give him a piece of my mind or I'd agree with him. And I'd talk to other, other local hosts. Never once got through to Sean Hannity or Rush. Although I tried many times. And I started to think, for whatever reason, right or wrong, that I could be a talk show host. And in fact, I was talking to my wife one day and she had watched this episode of Oprah and Oprah did a show about following your passions. So my wife corners me one day when I come home from a job that I'm not liking in Las Vegas. And she says, if you could be anything when you grow up, if you could have any passion or do anything that you wanted to do, what would you do? And I looked at her and I'm all, really, anything? And she's oh yeah. And I said, I'd be a talk radio host. And my wife... In that moment, I mean, she had a lot of choices. She could have laughed out loud at me. She could have scoffed. She could have mocked. She said, well, that's not, she could have said, well, that's not going to happen. She didn't. She looked at me and she said, okay, how do we make that happen? And I looked at her and I said, I don't know. <laughs> so I actually um, put together some ideas for shows and I sent them to different program directors. I had no, I'd never been behind a microphone. And it, so they never called me back. And uh, then I found on the computer one day on the interwebs an ad for a local radio station. And the ad said, host your own talk show. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. So I call them up and I uh, go down there. And it's this old house in the worst part of Las Vegas near the stratosphere. It's a little radio station. That is from a house, literally, the studio is the living room. They do production in the kitchen and editing in the bathroom. Literally, I'm not lying to you. And uh, it's a little 5,000 watt radio station. In comparison, KSL is a 50,000 watt radio station. And that affects how broad the signal is. And they explained to me, yeah, if you write us a check, we'll put you on the air. Now, I'd never heard of this station. So I started listening to it. 
And it's all infomercials from top to bottom. So it's the guy with the colon cleanser. It's the guy, the doctor who gives the same prescription, whether you have cancer or tennis elbow, because it's his, his own formulated medication. Uh, it's all infomercials top to bottom. And they're like, write us a check and we'll put you on the show. And we have an opening Friday mornings at 9 a.m. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) So I wrote him a check. And I had the whole hour, no commercials, nothing. I show up and they play some music and they turn the microphone on. And I start talking. And I give out the phone number. First few days, nobody calls. Uh, There's a guy there who wants to help me. So we come up with an intro to the show. Um, (laughs) I'm embarrassed by it now. But I went on the air as uh, as the X-Man, who was the host of the Generation X Files. I still have cassette tapes of this madness. But I that's what I did. My show was called the Generation X Files. And I was the X-Man. <laughs> and I would go on the air and I would share my thoughts about the politics and the current events going on. And then I started calling up Uh, people running for office and elected officials. And I was surprised they would come on my show. And then to pay for it, I had to go out and sell my own advertising. So my first client was my neighbor who I was, who was, had a little uh, lawn mowing company. He paid me $50 and I did commercials for his little, his little lawn company. And then uh, I was also trying to go to school at the time. So I was going to university of Phoenix And I met the dean there locally. And it turns out he was a Raiders fan and I was a Raiders fan. So we hit it off. And I told him about my little show. And he says to me, you know, I've got got some extra money in the budget that I wasn't sure what to do with. And I'm like, what do you mean extra money? He says, well, it's about $4,500 a month. And I'm like, really? I said, I could go on the air every day for that. And he's like, all right, let's do it. And he says, well, what are you going to do for me? And I said, why don't we do every show on Tuesday live from the University of Phoenix? And we'll interview your students and your staff. And he's like, done. So I go back to this little little station. It's KLAV, by the way. It's still there. And I tell him I've got $4,500 a month. And they're like, guess what? The noon hour just opened up. So I uh, bought the noon hour. And I still had a full-time day job, so I needed a little extra time to travel from my day job and back. So I went to my boss at the time, and I said, hey, I need a little extra time for lunch because I'm going to go do this radio show. And he's like, what? You're going to do what? And I said, yeah, I'm going to do a little radio show. And he said, okay, I'll give you the time off, but I'm telling you right now, that dog won't hunt. And if you know what that expression means, he said, I'll give you the time off, but you're going to fall flat on your face. I'm like, okay. So I left my day job every day for lunch. And instead of eating food, I did a talk show for an hour. And I kept getting on these local officials and I start getting regular callers and things like that. So then I start sending emails to the program directors in town. And I was not sending emails as myself. I set up a fake Gmail account with somebody else's name and I started emailing the program directors in that in Las Vegas as a listener saying, hey, you got to hear this guy on KLAV. He's amazing. Why isn't he on your station? So, yeah, I lied. And uh, (laughs) so, so, uh, one day I get an email and it's the program director of the station in Vegas that has Rush Limbaugh and Hannity. It's the number one talk station in Vegas, KXNT. And he says, Hey, um, why don't you come down and let's chat? And I'm like, okay. So I go and I sit down in his office and, uh, we talk and he goes, I got this email. Uh, from somebody who says they're a big fan of your show. And I kind of smiled and he looked at me and he said, you send it, didn't you? 
And I said, yeah, I did. And he said, I really like that. He says, I really like that you promote yourself. Uh, one of the other things that I did to promote myself back then is I set up a, a cell phone with a headset and I made a sign that said, we'll do talk radio for food. And I did my show from Sahara and Flamingo. I think that's right. Do those cross? I don't think those cross. The two main cross streets in Vegas. And I stood out there doing a live show on my headset with a sign that said, we'll do talk radio for food. So he heard about that. He loved my self-promotion. And he said to me, hey, I've got this Saturday show and he's not going to be here this weekend. And I listened to this Saturday show he's talking about. I really enjoyed it. And he said, will you fill in this Saturday for this guy? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I said, yeah, yeah, I would love to. So he gets me up and he takes me into the studio. And it is this unbelievable place. If you can imagine, this is CBS owned, uh, top of the line. I mean, I had been in a little house doing a show where where every show, once a show, the microphone would fall off the stand because it was being held on by rubber bands. And every day during my show, because it was lunchtime, the producer they assigned me would open a can of pineapple and you could hear the rusty pineapple can opening the can during the show. And now I'm inside KXNT and he's showing me how to control the show. And he's like, here's the phone bank. Here's how you bring the callers on. Here's how you drop them. Here's how you turn your microphone on. And then he pats me on the back and he says, have a great show. And that was it. He walked out. And I didn't see him again until the next Monday after I did that show. So I go into KXNT and I turn on the microphone and I start talking. And I'm so nervous. I already have a high voice. But when I get really nervous, my vocal cords tighten up and my voice goes way up. And the first three callers to the show were calling in just to tell me that I sound like the Aflac duck. <laughs> this was my first appearance as a paid talk show host. I got paid $25 an hour for that show, a three-hour show. And uh, after that, you know, things went well. I had great callers. People responded well. And uh, so I went in to meet with uh, the program director that Monday. And he said to me, I've carved out some time on Sunday. And I would love to offer you a Sunday show. Come in for two hours and do a show. And I'm like, okay. And so uh, that was my first professional gig. Uh, but he also said, I got to uh, I got to tell you that the X-Man is not going to fly and your real name is not going to work on the radio either. And if you don't know by now, you're going to find out right now. My real name is not Jay McFarland. My real name is Joey McFarland Smith. And he said, Joey Smith is not going to fly on the radio. So what are we going to call you? And I'm like, I don't know. So we bounced it around and we finally came up with Jay McFarland keep staying true to my middle name, which is my mother's maiden name. And I've been Jay McFarland ever since. From there, uh, the Saturday guy eventually left. So I did a Saturday and a Sunday show. I also did all the fill-in work on the station. So the number one morning talk show in Las Vegas at the time, Alan Stock and Heidi Harris, uh, when they were out for Christmas break, I was the guy. So I was doing the morning show that I used to listen to on the radio, driving around. I'm now hosting the show Christmas morning, trying to get phone calls. And thank goodness for truckers, because there's enough of them on the road to call in and have a conversation. So from there, I, you know, I tried to get a job. I actually came up to KSL and I interviewed for a job during that time. I didn't get that job. And uh, I didn't know how I would ever progress to the next level because KXNT had a great morning show and they had a great afternoon show. But eventually my program director left and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm his pet project. I have no real experience here. I'm, I'm done. My career's over. This guy's leaving. 
Fortunately, the new program director liked me and we had a great relationship. But my old program director had moved to Dallas to take over a talk station and a sports station there. And shortly after KSL decided not to hire me, I got a call from him saying, I've got an opening for you in Dallas, which at the time was the number five market in in talk radio, nine to noon, every day, Monday through Friday, but there's a catch. And I'm like, what's the catch? And he said, you have to be here on the air in two weeks. And I'm like, done. So that's how I went from part-time radio, actually paid radio, to part-time radio, to full-time radio. And then I was on the air in in Dallas for five years. uh, And that's when KSL recruited me and I came out and did a show called The Browsers for five years, which I loved. And uh, then Amy left for her own reasons. And after that, they said, well, we don't know what we're going to do with you. So um, so just do whatever you think is best till we figure it out. And so I reverted back to the show I was doing in Dallas. And they said, hey, we kind of like this. So they put a name on it. They called it the J-Mac News Show. I did that for five more years until I decided to run for Congress, which at that time I had to resign from the radio and... Did not win at Congress, and KSL is not looking for new help right now. And so if I want to return to talk radio, there's talk radio jobs all over the country, by the way, right now. I, I see 10 of them right now. And uh, But my kids live here. I've set up roots here. So I haven't applied for a single talk radio job since I left KSL. And I don't know if I would go back. I love this format. I love what we do here. I love the control of it. Uh, But again, I need your help to be a supporter so that I can keep doing it. But that is the story. That is the, uh, that is the uh, story of how I got into talk radio. I basically got in the back door. I bought my way in and got lucky that the, probably the one program director in the country who was putting together pet projects uh, listened to me and saw something there, <laughs> the X-Men on the Generation X-Files, and gave me a chance. And I'm still very good friends with him. And if something opens up in Dallas, he would probably offer me a job to come back. And then I would be faced with a really difficult decision. So that is the story, my friends. My friends.